The Yellow Turbans Campaign Pack is the early adopter bonus, or the bonus that you received for purchasing the game within the very first week. Continuing my kind of tirade through the many tutorials of this game, you guys have largely requested a breakdown of the three Yellow Turbans Generals. They do play vastly different than the other Three Kingdoms generals, so in this video, we're going to go through Han Yi, Gong Du, Huang Chao, and talk about each one of their individual mechanics, what makes them different, how they all work together. Um, you'll see as you play through them, each one of them is a different class, and the Yellow Turbans only have access to three classes. So we're going to dive into these, go through the mechanics heavily in the very first video we talk about, to we'll talk about the Yellow Turbans as a faction, as a whole, and then we'll go through quickly the other two as we shore up more of the conversation on how it works to play those two factions and what it looks like uh, trying to expand them across the campaign. So join me in another tutorial as we go through Three Kingdoms and the Yellow Turbans. And the first warlord we'll talk about is Han Yi. Now, he is the healer, the legendary healer of the Yellow Turban Rebellion. And the Yellow Turbans have a whole different mechanic here in mind. So we're going to be on the screen for a little bit longer than our typical uh, Lord video or, or Warlord discussion. So to start, start with, he has the Dominion of He Yi, which increases replenishment and decreases uh, the recruitment cost of things as well as corruption as it progresses. Now, he's got some three unique features as well. He's got the Village Healer, which increases population growth and public order. He also has Aid the Wounded, which is an option for occupying a town. We'll show you that in a little second here. And he also has uh, Yujia, the Heavy Assault Infantry here. So good against armor, and they're, they have Guerrilla Deployment, which you'll see as a whole is really strong for the Yellow Turbans. Now, as you take a look here, this is different, right? This is not uh, marked. Or second marquis, marquis, duke, king, and then emperor. This is balanced, healed, empowered, ascended, enlightened, yellow sky mandate. The whole objective of the Yellow Turban Rebellion was to purify China and not unify it in the same way as it is for every other general. The generals of the Yellow Turban felt that they had to put an end to the tyranny of warlords and tyrants, such as Dong Zhuo or Cao Cao. So the whole objective here is to, again, help. Uh, rid yourselves of that kind of uh, overarching uh, power source. So when you take a look at these, you'll see that they acute, there's a special resource called Enlightenment in the place of prestige. Accumulate Enlightenment by researching reforms, constructing special buildings, increasing character skills, and granting character positions. Once sufficient Enlightenment is attained, the next faction rank is unlocked. A higher faction rank provides better bonuses and gives access to new reforms. This is not unlike any other situation. But we do have it granting a couple more things, bonuses to replenishment, uh, diplomatic options are increased through here as well, just like we see with the uh, typical faction summary. You can see that your enlightenment's over here, we're currently seeking right now. So you gain enlightenment through a number of factors we'll go into when we talk about uh, the reform tree, but Hong Yi as a whole has a special kind of delineation. He is a healer. There are three character classes for the Yellow Turban Rebellion. There's the Healer, the Scholar, and the Veteran. So the Healer, as you can, if you hover over this, it says Legendary Healer, excels at, its, at inspiring troops in fighting at range, but weaker in melee. So this is kind of your combination of a strategist and a commander. Even though it has a yellow and, or I'm sorry, red and green as his colors, which have to do with the general's health and it has to do with his melee damage, it, his focuses for his skills are more towards the people. When you take a look at all fronts, you know, this increases uh, melee evasion and armor. When you take a look at judgment, this increases melee base, or this gives, a, um, this is a huge attack that does flash damage and redu reduces the melee damage by 50%. In addition, he's got one with the people, which is a passive buff that's always applied in his aura, giving him morale and melee evasion to everyone around him. Uh, every one of the, the classes will have these three abilities here. Um, obviously, since he's a legendary character they're all unlocked to start with but as you progress through these you'll see certain things that uh, tell you exactly how the character is meant to be played now i'll be totally honest with you when i look at this and see legendary healer excels at inspiring troops and fighting at range i don't think that's the case this is a personal opinion now uh, this is out of the constraints of what the game is telling us um i personally find that hong yi especially is very strong in combat he can just decimate people. His instinct is 112, giving him a 23% melee damage buff. If I hover over his weapon, he's got quite a bit of melee damage coming out of this bad boy. So I feel like this tooltip might be a little bit misleading, especially when I look at skills like um, 
Tranquility is really cool. It, it gives a passive uh, buff to him as far as recovery. Um, when I look at Zeal, increases AP damage from our, his own army. Increases his melee attack rate by 40%. Increases his expertise. He's got a lot of the combination of skills that you would typically see on a Sentinel and on a Vanguard. Hence, the green and... Uh, I, I keep wanting to say fucking yellow. I know that's green and red. So, in my opinion, I find the Han Yi, or at least the healer, to be quite good in combat. And I'm not sure how you guys uh, experience that as well. But let me know what your opinions are in the, in the comments if you feel different. But... In my experience, I feel like the healer is quite good in combat. Now, uh, Ha Man, or He Man, as he is so commonly known, is the scholar. Excels at engaging enemy generals and highly skilled at foes, and highly skilled foes, but easily overwhelmed. Um, they're trying to say that he's kind of fits the role of a champion in some regard. And again, I don't necessarily feel that. This is his colors would tell me Sentinel for purple, and it would tell me that his yellow is Commander. And we see that reflected down in the skills that he gets benefits from. He gets the ability to give uh, range fire, or I'm sorry, increases the firing rate and ranged armor piercing of his army. Um, he has a lot of different abilities that don't quite tell me champion right out the gate. Um, he gets Hail of Arrows, which increases the range attack of things. Or it's a missile attack, I'm sorry. He gets uh, Binding Fury. He also gets uh, Surprise Attack. So... Their buffs are not necessarily concordant with what their tooltip says. You have to really play these characters a little more in line with um, how you're going to build their skills up. So if you want this character to be um, a little bit more focused towards administration, which I feel the Scholar kind of suits a little bit better, then build the skill lines that make the most sense for that. Um, you're really going to want to stack these skills in the way that makes the most sense for, again, the role you have in mind. This is nothing new or anything I haven't said before when it comes to building out characters. Basically, choose a character, choose what you want them to be, and then build those skills accordingly. There is another one called the uh, Veteran. We'll probably get that on the next turn here, so we'll go ahead and attack this guy. I always recommend fighting these fights, but we're going to delegate it real quick. Alright, we'll just do that. Now we got the Heirloom Spear of Ha Yi, nifty. I'll talk about those in just a second as well. Press that. Okay, stop doing that. Where did it say to go? Capture not by any cell. Okay. And if we've got this settlement, Oof. our first one. How nifty is that? I, I've already played a little bit of a uh, Ha Yi campaign, and I think yeah, I wouldn't. So we'll wait next turn and we'll talk a bit more about that. You can, if, if you don't know this, you can click this guy and right click him. And yeah, I can either merge or transfer troops. We'll merge. Now we have a little bit stronger of an army and we'll move down over here. So this is a good time to go into reforms and how enlightenment. So let's click this button. You can see that otherwise... It, you have to wait until turn 5 to start your reforms on every other faction, right? Well, the reform system for the Yellow Turbans is more like the conventional Total War system. This is like we've seen in most other games, where you are taking turns to research addition, uh, different abilities. And you've got three overall mandates, I guess you could say, books, what they call them. Book of the Heavens, Book of the People, and then Book of the Land. And each one of these coincide with a specific ruler. Uh, so we can see that uh, our healer is going to be the Book of the People. And through this, you'll see a lot of different um, researches or reforms that really are going to speak to how this overall book, quote-unquote, or this lord, plays to. I mean, Han Yi is very much about the people, and not less so much about a strong military force or different other factors from the Book of Heaven. So this is your Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3, Tier 4, and last year, Tier 5. And as you progress in your faction rank, so you require faction rank balanced, you will un be able to unlock these additional reforms. Let's take a look at this one. This will increase my population, or I'm sorry, um, yeah, this one. Um, all these tiers have the ability to unlock other units. So if I were to research Embolden the People, boop, it's going to take four turns to, um, to uh, research. You can see that in this up left corner right here going to grant me 10 enlightenment as soon as uh, I finish this, and I'm going to get access to white wave horsemen and white wave veterans. 
And each one of these lords will have a tier two, or I'm sorry, tier three, I guess you could say, um, technology unlocked. So Hun Yi starts with Yu Jia. I believe that uh, Gong Du starts with uh, Guardians of the Land. And Huang Shao starts with Archery Masters. Uh, we'll take a look when we get into them. I can't remember off the top of my head. But each one of these is focused at one of those lords. But you have to make sure you're constantly putting effort towards these reforms in the way that it makes, again, the most sense for your campaign style. Do you want to have to be or do you want to be able to build a lot of buildings right off the bat? Well, then you should have gone with the construction and not with the more military. Or there's these uh, or, uh, or there are these up here <laughs> that help with satisfaction, that help with like, additional units here. You get your sword and spear infantry from that, that arena. Here you're going to get your heavy spear infantry and your light bow cavalry. So you do kind of have to dip across both of these. And the nice thing is that in order to get, let's say, let's say I am playing Ho Yi like I am right now. Um, and I want to train, uh, tolerate autonomy. Well, all I have to do is reach the, the, uh, back the faction rank of balanced to get here. I don't have to train a bunch of precursors. So it's nice because you can, you can dot your way across the reform tree. That makes the most sense for what you want to do. You don't have to say, okay, well, I really have to go heavy into the Book of Heaven to get over here to value modesty. So that's the nice thing about this campaign is it's very pick and choose. And again, it plays kind of heavily into the same way we see the reform tree for the other warlords. The other warlords have a pretty free-flowing one. Sure, they have a natural progression through some of their paths, but for the most part, you can jump around to any position um, as long as it's connected to something else. But I mean, any position in sense of color. Now, that satisfies our reform requirement. Let's go ahead and end our turn. We'll talk about some final things about the yellow turbans before wrapping it up and moving on over to Gongdu. Slowly making our way downtown here. Um, one thing I do want to talk about with the yellow turbans is the amount of ancillaries they have access to. You're going to find yourself... Oh, oh! if you didn't know, you can press N, and N will show you any issues that you currently have. So, okay. Oh, we got low military supplies over here and army action points uh, that are ready. Oh, over here we've got constructions available in both the, the settlement and the commandery capital. So, press N to, sh to show and hide those uh, warnings. That's this button right here. Investigation is investigate issues. So... Yellow turbans get a ton, a ton, 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 ton of ancillaries. Obviously, we start with the family spear, but we're going to progress over here to the uh, uh, heirloom spear of Hong Yi. It's part of my Lord of Fire set, which is pretty sick. Now, of course, I would never swap out Hong Yi's armor. It's bound to me, so I cannot swap it out. But go ahead and do that. Equip that. It's stronger for him. Um, same thing over here, probably pretty cool you've got all sorts of cool things now the yellow turbans look at this it should show me there we go they get access to so many ancillaries so quickly and you can use these ancillaries to really further your diplomatic goals i mean ancillaries are a great 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 way to help you negotiate so if i'm trying to do a quick deal <clears throat> see who doesn't who likes me the most Dong Zhuo, surprisingly enough. Um, oh, no one wants to fucking do this. But I'll just click this button and not do anything. God damn it. Um, click this button. Just trying to bring up the... Oh, okay, whatever, Dong Zhuo. But my point is, you can use those ancillaries in a lot of your diplomatic endeavors way easier because they'll all be usually gold or silver ranked. Meaning they'll have a lot of weight when it comes to offering them up because you'll have so many of them quite literally coming out of your ass. You see a lot of, you'll see uh, in a South South campaign, you can use food as a tradable resource and a way to really help uh, substantiate your claim in a diplomatic relation. Same thing here with, with uh, the yellow turbans. Rather than using food though, you're going to be using ancillaries all over the place to help you kind of further your goal. It's a very kind of cool me uh, mechanic for them. And one of the other things I want to talk about, all of the yellow turbans have access to this. So we have two generals right now. Let's go ahead and press recruit. Select here. Now we have Guo Da as a dollar. God damn it, I want to look at a veteran. We'll look at a veteran on Gongdu, I promise. Well, if I click captains, I have a bunch of captains I can choose from. One of my missions even says recruit a yellow turban spearman captain. Boop, there we go. So this is the only other faction aside from uh, Yuan Shuao and Yuan, Yuan Shao and um, Sun Zhan that has access to these captains so readily and so easily. So 
This is a great way to build up a force very quickly. Yeah, be mindful though that these are peasants and they're not going to be anyone of any substantial worth in the long term, but it's a great way to get a really strong or a really big army quickly on the battlefield. Um, the last thing I wanted to go over this, so let's see if we can get it from this. Crap, we can't. But we'll wait one more turn here real quick and hopefully we'll have a veteran in our recruitment pool and we can talk about them a little bit. But overall, I think Han Yi is the easiest of the three yellow turbans if I were to start a yellow turban campaign, which is, again, I feel it's a little bit more like a conventional total war, and it's easier for most people to break into. There's not as many brand new mechanics. It should feel a lot uh, similar, I guess you could say. I'll delegate. Hopefully we'll beat it in one go. Decisive victory. Yay. So we can do occupy and aid wounded versus just occupy. This will decrease the population, as always, give us a little bit of income, but it'll give us a massive amount of population growth and some good military supplies, as to be expected. Most of them are used during the aiding process. But the big thing here is, of course, the population growth. Yep, yep, yep. And then you can see over here the Dominion of Hong Yi, which we talked about earlier. This is a plus 10% to replenishment. Population reduces recruitment cost in local commanderies, which is very cool. That's why you would use Occupy and uh, Aid, because this way, as those commanderies increase in population size, thus drops your recruitment cost, and your replenishment's already getting benefited as well, and you get a nice reduction to your corruption. I think the last thing we haven't gone over is the unique building. Do that right here. It is the healing line of buildings. It, since it's a yellow building, it does affect population growth, which, again, will play heavily into the Dominion of Hong Yi and increases public order. A lot of you guys were talking about having public order be an issue as you build through your settlements, right? This has a uh, well, 40, minus 46 food production will cause issues with your public order. But also as your population grows, um, well, not on this campaign, I'm sorry. It's in the other campaigns. As your population grows, you will suffer public order issues from overpopulation and your yellow buildings here will help you kind of counter that. Especially, of course, um, as we take a look at the healing building line for uh, Han Yi. You can also see that some of these buildings are a little bit different than your normal warlords. So be mindful when you're building these. I mean, farming is no longer government support. Or I'm sorry, a farmer, farmer housing is no longer... Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one's no longer governmental support. So these are not the same building types as you know before. Recruitment is different. It's not called conscription. Temple is different. It's no longer called uh, administration buildings. So you're going to have a happier populace. You're going to have a more voluminous, well, voluminous populace, but you're not going to be having the highly trained state troops of, say, some of the more advanced militaries. That's what forces you to kind of go heavily into the reform tree to kind of balance that out. But this kind of goes through Han Yi at a very high level. Uh, if you're playing a Han Yi campaign, what I would say is you can do a lot of damage by getting up a lot of this Han Empire portion. I believe this is uh, abandoned too. So if I were Han Yi, I would expand north and either collapse onto Cao Cao, uh, Gangzhou, or Liu Biao as quickly as possible. Uh, you can actually get rid of your issues with, with Dong Zhuo in time, but for the most part, he's going to be dealing with so much bullshit, he won't be a natural enemy to you. Cao Cao is going to be probably your biggest point of competition. So making sure that you put him kind of in a hard spot is important, especially since I expanded to the, to the uh, Chen farmland, and that's this commandery. So my next target naturally would be uh, Cao Cao in this particular uh, campaign. Let's jump over to another warlord and keep going through the uh, yellow turbines for you guys. Just moving right along to Gongdu, our next general on the list here. And honestly, I would say the hardest on the list. If Hong Yi is the easiest, then Gongdu is quite easily the hardest. So he's got the Dominion of Gongdu, just so we had the Dominion of Hong Yi. And for him, it increases campaign movement range and increases loot from battles. Uh, obviously, his focus is on raiding and looting. As a result, he gets guerrilla warfare, a military building chain. He gets the stance Liberate when he's in um, enemy territory, which allows him to steal food and reserves from local regions, that way allowing him to replenish his military supplies and his troops. In addition, he starts with Guardians of the Land unlocked. Uh, you can see here it says at the very top, unlocked from the start. So this tells you this is not a unique unit of Gongdu. This is just one that he starts unlocked with. Now, one thing I unfortunately didn't do with Han Yi, I'm so sorry, guys. Um, 
Usually I talk about the uh, character profile a little bit more here. This is on the character selection screen, which you'll see at the bottom. Plus five military supplies in enemy territory, which is quite nice. It benefits especially from his stance to uh, liberate people. And then plus 10% armor for all spear infantry, making him uh, quite nice when it comes to building out those spears, which come hand in hand with the reform tree right there. Or I'm sorry, the Book of the Land, which he starts heavily into. Lankish valuables, get you access to heavy spear infantry, thus benefiting uh, that little innate bonus. So with Gongdu, he is our first veteran we've taken a look at, and it says, excels at holding out against many enemies, but susceptible to armor-piercing damage. So he kind of has the mentality of a sentinel. He starts, of course, with a high resolve, giving him that nice little uh, green there, and he also gets a lot of cunning, hence the blue. Now, in my mind, I find the veteran to be closest to the champion. I, I've used veterans and had them really wreck shop a little bit more so than uh, the other classes. The healer is still quite strong, um, but the veteran is, is still equally, if not more, strong in combat, in my personal opinion, my anecdotal experience. And the way I'm looking at this, though, is the legendary characters, which skews things a little bit. Like I said, Han Yi has a disgustingly high amount of instinct to start with, so... Be mindful that your actual generic characters might be a little bit different in their uh, kind of battlefield prowess, I guess you could say. So his uh, characteristics, he's got Killing Ground, which uh, reduces the speed, melee attack rate, and does splash damage of everything around him. Um, in addition, he's got Desperate Cry, which uh, is a massive debuff. Well, I'm sorry, no, this is the one that gives a buff to melee damage, AP, and charge bonus. And then he also has one with the land. Uh, speed increase. So all of them have a really cool kind of passive bonus you can see here. Uh, nature's ally for the veteran here. Ooh. I forgot that some some veterans have uh, different abilities here in these lower portions. Um, this is his specific one. But nature's ally is another veteran ability. I think there's one or two other um, healer and or um, Scholar abilities. If, if you guys spy those, feel free to let me know in the comments and I'll pin it for sure. Breach. That's that's another one of them. 50% uh, armor and melee evasion for scholars. Um, inner fire, which I don't think we went into with the other scholar, which increases melee attack rate. And then condemn, which reduces melee evasion and flash damage tech. But Gongdu as a whole, I find very, very strong in combat. Let's go ahead and do this. We'll delegate this little tasky poo. Go ahead and waffle stomp that guy. Oh, uh, we'll just that's whatever. Get his pull mace of of uh, Gongdu. Also, you know, yellow turban spearman captain. The game will kind of step you along the some of the the big things that are unique to the character, obviously. Pop into the ambush stand. So. He does have a unique building line, as we well know, and it's Guerrilla Warfare. So as we take a look at the very end of this, it increases post-battle loot income by 25% and grants military supplies. So it's a great way to kind of stay mobile because you're allowed to really do a lot of raiding damage from this thing because it's a faction-wide bonus. In addition to, let's look off of that, the minion of Gongdu, 10% campaign movement range and 10% post-battle loot income. That stacks up to 35% right there. And then minus 10% to corruption. Um, so Gongdu himself, though, is very difficult. And the biggest reason for that is that Ma Tung starts right there. He's right there and he goes for Wu Du on turn one. Like, that's his go to move. I, in fact, I kind of think for Gongdu, one of the best starting moves, rather than attacking this force, is take the town of Wu Du. It'll help to kind of keep. Um, what's this guy's name? <laughs> Ma Tung in check a little bit because then he won't have a major town to defend. And if you have access, if you have control of Wu Du, you're in a little bit stronger of a, of a st starting point. I mean, honestly, what I did right here, you're probably better off killing this army, going into normal, and then attacking Wu Du. Um, the, the garrison's not going to give you much of an issue. If you just blitz it hard enough, you do have a lot of cab at your disposal. So use those to your advantage and really get up in that cookie jar and get that stuff quickly. Um, but as a whole, if you do not do that, you'll your only little settlement will be up here. And in that case, it's really hard to move around. 
So since Gong Du is starting up in these mountains with all these trees, his movement range is significantly reduced, especially as he traverses this path. It's not a paved road. There's no path through here, even though the, the trees kind of make a natural clearing. There's no like set paved road. So something you should know is like the more established a route, the easier it is to traverse the campaign map. You'll see that when you try to move through a bunch of, uh, if I were to go like this, I think I got enough move. See, like I could barely move up there, right? But if I do this, I can move all the way over here because it's a clear path. So be mindful of that because when you're playing Gong Du, you're really up against the wall as far as your mobility, your ability to recruit new units quickly because you only start with a copper mine. You have to get momentum quickly. And I think the best way to do it is taking the Wu Du uh, town over here. In addition to that, you know, you're going to be looking through your reforms as you would any other general. In my opinion, you know, sticking heavily into the spears is your best bet. These are your two big spear ones, uh, the relinquished valuables and then encourage militias. It's going to give you access to militia of virtue, a spear infantry, and then the chanters. Um, I have not been able to recruit chanters. I just haven't done it yet. You see that little blue icon? That is a passive buff that chanters give. Um, very reminiscent to some of the stuff from Rome 1. Where you had, um, like the Barbarians had the, the Chanters that would just, if you put them in Chant Stance, they would give a uh, benefit to things around them. But again, be mindful of those things. Uh, also know that if you're going to be playing Gong Du, you're going to be heavy into industry. You need to build the tree that makes the most sense for industry. I believe it's manufacturing? No. Labor housing. Yes. You want labor housing as much as possible. You want to choose the reforms that make the most sense for that as well. I'm not sure about the income. This is income from all sources. I'm not as familiar with the this tree as I am with the reform tree tree, like the, the real tree. <laughs> but look for those that really make the most sense for industry, right? The, silk is its own type of resource, but you can stack industry with the copper mine and with whatever you take in wood. That's the way I would really approach uh, Gong Du. And again, I'll swap his two-headed mace with full mace. Yeah, you can take a look here. Give it more resolve, 500 more melee damage. What I find interesting is this is exceptional and this is unique. That's supposed to be weird how that works, right? Again, you're going to get a heap of ancillaries. Make sure you're stacking those as you need to. Um, a lot of the skills in general too, and I, I, this is something I didn't talk about. They are different for yellow turbans, but they're also the same at the same time. Like intensity, we know this one from all the other warlords. But inspiration, brand new. Focus, brand new. So look at these a lot before you decide how you want to build your character. Make sure you're choosing skills that are going to be in line with what you want the character to be on the campaign map or in the battle map. But that kind of sums up things for Gong Du here. Let's move over to our last lord in uh, Huan Shao and uh, kind of wrap this video up for you guys. We've reached the end of the line here in Huang Shuao. Now I want to go into some things that I didn't talk about in our previous two warlords that also pertain to them. We're going to talk about the court system and we're going to talk about how you recruit officers for the Yellow Turban, as it is different for this faction entirely. Um, I saved it for Huang Shuao because it's kind of the linchpin of who he is. So he has the Dominion of Huang Shuao, and that increases character experience and research rate. Um, all the Dominions, if you haven't gathered this, give a passive reduction to corruption, which is quite nice. He also gets his uh, Archer Masters unlocked for him from the start. Then he gets Seek Talented Individuals, which is an assignment that he can put people on to get exceptional characters easier. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And lastly, he gets the Gardens Governmental Building Chain, which increases research rate and satisfaction. So Huang Shuo himself is the wielder of the Heavenly Way, and he has quite a lot of expertise and quite a lot of authority. If we hover over here, expertise, cunning, and authority are his primary focuses. Also, he increases population growth and melee evasion for melee. Now, um, one thing I kind of loosely touched on are these three unique abilities, right? So he gets Favorable Skies, which is a range block chance. Um, he also gets one with the Heavens, with range damage increase. And then lastly, he gets the Prize Attack, which we've seen before. Now, as you kind of look through some of these characters, you'll see that, okay, this is a veteran and this is a veteran. They've got different abilities. It's based upon their background. So the uh, Guang Hai is a philosopher, while, while Pei Yuan Chuao is a virtuous outrider. So depending upon their background it will determine their skill tree, just like it does for other warlords throughout the other uh, Three Kingdoms games. I'm sorry, the other characters, not so much warlords. So the character's background determines their skill tree. So 
Again, same thing with their military, uh, the class dictates that as well. <clears throat> so, as you're taking a look at the yellow turbans, you're going to notice some things that are different. And that is namely how you deal with characters. Let's do this. Delegate that battle. So we've already talked about how all of the uh, yellow turbans get access to uh, captains. Let's make a spearman captain, bro. That was a cool axe that we got. We'll get this cool weapon. We'll equip that weapon. Cool axe. Not that axe. You that axe. If you press this button, records, it'll show you all those little things I just out of. Ceremonial stone axe. That's pretty nifty. Okay. I just really wanted to see what that axe was. That had no bearings on this video at all. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and <clears throat> well, we'll do the reforms real quick. That's a good time to talk about research rate. Since this character has such a high innate research rate as a, as a uh, uh, symptom of dominion of Huan Chao, uh, you can get research abilities very quickly. And that's going to be one of the big boons of him. So we're actually going to choose this one to increase character experience. Now, the reason we're doing that going to take four turns to complete, as we know, that little little icon right there. The reason we're doing that is because this also will stack with his um, character experience gain from the Dominion of Huang Shuao. So by stacking these two, we're going to be getting more research rate as we increase our faction rate, and we're going to be getting more character experience from that in specific reform. Let's go ahead and end this turn, and we can talk about the next portion of characters, retinues, and all that jazz. So... Uh, the starting location for Huang Shao is, in my mind, way easier than Gongdu. Uh, Gongdu has, like, too many factors going on over there for him. Ma Tung is over there. Uh, it's harder to move through the mountains. It's just no, no fun for anyone. But, taking a look here, press this button, go to Captains, and we'll turn to Spearman. Now, you should have noticed by now, and if you haven't, it's because I didn't talk about it, uh, yellow turbans don't have a court system where they can recruit characters. Yellow turbans have the ability to attract characters. As they expand their lands, as they increase their influence and enlightenment, more characters will rally to their cause. So when you take a... I unfortunately don't have an assignment unlocked to be able to do this, but we'll show unavailable. Rallying sympathizers will allow Huang Shao to attract more um, legendary characters, or characters of, of increased worth. Not just a simple level one, two, or three uh, veteran or, or healer or scholar. This then plays into your court system, which we haven't talked with about with any of the characters. But these courts are divided into three areas. And the three areas should be pretty obvious. Lord of Heaven, Lord of the Land, and then Lord of the People. Now, the people would be a healer. See, uh, Zhang Liang uh, originally held this title. Its role is to bridge between heaven and earth and maintain harmony. This office can only be held by healer characters. Lord of the land, veteran characters. Lord of heaven, scholar characters. So, as you expand your court, as you increase these individual ranks and locations, you can only place certain classes in them. Thus, kind of um, promoting a diverse court where you're not just focusing solely on, say, uh, scholar, I'm sorry, um, strategists in your administration slot and sentinels in your other slots. Um, it really focuses you on filling these roles with characters that make a lot of sense. And with Huang Shao, the nice thing about that is you can get characters that are very strong as, uh, as a result of this assignment. Um, oh, uh, ah, fucker. There it is. Rally sympathizers and... Because of this, you can have them level up quickly because they're getting a lot of experience quickly. So it's a really, really cool system. Local leaders are basically like your administrators. That's just a fancy name for them, more or less. So you you should really be looking at those kind of things, especially in a Huang Shao campaign when characters are a huge emphasis for him because he can steamroll their um, optimization so quickly. Now, taking a look at Dong and looking at the... Uh, <laughs> Dong. Taking a look at the gardens. This is the special, unique for Huang Chuao. Now this increases satisfaction and research rate. So if I were to just get this on like turn two somehow, can't, um, that would stack with my dominion to grant me 35% additional research rate, which is which is just a lovely little treat. I even think I have got like ancillaries I can do to increase that further. I could put the ceremonial stone axe onto him. 
satisfaction retinue upkeep and that's huge so i mean you're going to be getting okay again a ton of uh, ancillaries you can use those in your diplomatic endeavors but you can really see how these captains are going to be your only way to recruit characters at whim otherwise you're stuck waiting for characters to come to your force to your uh, uh forces i think that's okay so turn three you saw that we've, we had our two current generals plus that one in our court just kind of waiting right we should get another one. It, it typically around turn three or four, you just get another one. It's a pretty random. Yeah, see, here we go. Okay. So again, you just attract this guy. You didn't even see any, anything over here that says like, hey, your faction's expanded. It's just, it happens. So you'll be gaining people quickly. Um, their satisfaction doesn't work as... Um, Similar to the other warlords, it's very different. They don't constantly demand higher core positions. You can see there's no position ranks to promote them to. So people as a whole stay satisfied longer because they've chosen to join your cause. You haven't recruited them from some sort of candidate pool. So um, how you would deal with a Huang Shua campaign really depends on how you want to expand. You've got Huang Yi like right here, uh, right here and here. Cao Cao is right there. You've got Liu Bei right over there. In fact, he actually, yeah, so he's already taken the Iron Mine at Dong. Um, Kong Rong is over here, and then this is all Han Empire. Pretty much from here, up here, through up to this portion over there is all Han Empire. So if I were doing a Huang Shuao campaign, my f goal would be to ignore Yuan Shuao and ignore Gong Sun Zan, and actually push east and south. That would be my big primary goal. Um, you could push through Liu Dai into the Han Empire and link up right away with Han Yi. That's not a bad call at all. Uh, this is abandoned, so you can actually even take that if you want, the Imperial City itself. Um, it does cost 8,000 to colonize it, though, so be mindful of that. Um, but you've got Liu Biao right here and Cao Cao right there. So you're going to be sandwiched in between two pretty big superpowers that are trying to expand quickly. Taking this route through Gong, through Kong Rong or over the hills over here is a little bit safer, and you can link up over time with Han Yi. The... How aggressive you want to be will determine what your path is going to be. You can go down this way through the yellow turbans and right into Cao Cao's face. You've got two more factions right here. Tao Qian's right there. You've got these two, uh, or these two right here uh, that you can push right through. So you, you've got a lot of options. But my opinion, cementing this area as your power base is very good because you've got nothing to your back. And everything to your north is going to be preoccupied. And you can see coming quite a long ways away. And everything to your south, for the most part, is Han Empire over here. So you have a, a less aggressive situation than expanding west or directly south. East, I think, is the way to go with Huang Shuao. But hopefully this kind of helped you out with some Huang Shuao here. And we'll kind of uh, we'll wrap this, up, this video up with a nice summary of uh, all three. And by summary of all three, I just simply mean let's just talk about all three of them again real quick. <laughs> so no matter what you do with the yellow turbans, you're going to find a play style that is very reminiscent to the traditional Total War experience. You're going to have a research tree that is very similar to what you're used to. You're going to have generals that are a little bit more, I'm sorry, you're going to have warlords or characters that are a little bit more generalist, easier than saying generals being generalist, than your typical highly specialized Three Kingdoms characters. So this, I feel, is an, actually a better breaking point for a lot of people struggling with the Three Kingdoms campaign so far. Hong Yi is a very strong character, and his innate bonuses to population and public order make him really, really easy to get your feet wet in the game. He has a lot of natural enemies that you can get a good progression for. Gong Du is a little bit more of an advanced character, and if you're not familiar with Total War, maybe hold off on him a little bit. But if you are familiar with Total War, I feel like his recipe for success is all about utilizing those raiding mechanics and getting the momentum in the upper hand quickly on Ma Tong. Wang Shuao, on the other hand, is again, very similar to Han Yi in that he is uh, very open mechanically. He's very easy to access. The, really, the hardest parts about him are deciding how you want to expand your empire and where you want to move from. Do you want to move east into Kong Rong and deal with uh, more of the Han Empire? Do you want to move south into Cao Cao? Or, north, or southwest into Liu Biao. However you play these campaigns, hopefully this really gave you a good idea on how to approach them, or at least the Yellow Turbans as a whole. I understand there are some differences in these characters, and hopefully um, you haven't gotten too ingrained with the Three Kingdoms other characters that these ones now confuse you that they're, since they're so similar to the typical Total War uh, format. But guys, thank you so much for watching here today. If you have any other tutorial videos you would like to see or questions you're struggling with, please go ahead and let me know. I did a live stream Q&A. Hopefully that helped you out. You can find that in the, um, 
playlist linked at the end of this video here or in the final 15 seconds. But as always, guys, have a good one and take care.